On behalf of the entire Small Business Institute here at LaSalle, I would like to thank you guys all for coming out this evening. Uh, this evening is a great opportunity for us to connect our school to the local community. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we have multiple members of the Newton Needham Chamber of Commerce here tonight, uh, here to review our posters and everything that we've done over the last semester. For us as students, this is a great opportunity to get out there and show what we've been working tirelessly on for the last couple of semesters. Um, this event's kicking off a host of different events for the Newton Eater Chamber of Commerce. They have an entire month coming up, the Small Business Institute Month. So we're taking this opportunity to get our foot in the door and really present to them what we've been working on doing. Um, this evening, we've got a host of different business plans. If you look around the room, all these different posters are hold ownership to a business plan that has taken multiple students, multiple months to deliver and create. Uh, we also have a market research class who's been here doing research on opportunities in small businesses. And then we have a host of incredible speakers here to talk about their experience with multiple different industries across the Small Business Institute area and different, different aspects that include that. Um, so without any further ado, um, I would like to start off by introducing the president of LaSalle College, President Michael Alexander, to start off and talk a little bit about his experience and welcome us. Thank you, Sean. My job is simply to welcome you all here tonight. So welcome, great to have you here and to introduce and uh, welcome our speakers, our very speakers, Mayor Warren, who I think will be here shortly, President of the uh, Chamber, Greg Reedman, uh, Dr. Paul Levy, and Daryl Settles. We're happy, we thank you all for coming and happy that you're here. Um, now, as I said, my, my job is, is just to introduce our topic today, which is the dynamics of small business in a changing environment failures, successes, and opportunities. Uh, now, as many of you learned, giving a podium, podium over to a uh, college president in front of a large audience like this is, is dangerous, so it's not so easy to get me off. I want to, I want to take the opportunity to tell you a, a little story. In, in 2003, I founded a company on the Needham-Newton line called Echo Bridge Entertainment. It didn't really exist before that date, and it, the idea was to build a film distribution company that would operate worldwide. And so what we did is we started buying libraries of movies, existing movies, movies that had already been produced, uh, in bunches. And uh, we had some investors who were behind us and giving us the money to do so, and we had to start from the beginning and hire employees from scratch, but we did have these producing assets. We started, it wasn't quite like a venture, it wasn't quite like starting up from scratch, because we had acquired contracts these, with these movies. So when you acquire the rights to the movies, they come with, with licenses that have payment plans. So it actually had cash flow right from the beginning. By the fourth month, this, this uh, company was cash flow positive. Um, but as you know, like a lot of small companies, it, it has fits and starts. About a year later, we uh, purchased a, a, distribution, a DVD distribution company that was located in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, now it so happened that right after we did that, the market, the DVD market started to go down. So that looked like it was kind of a, maybe not the wisest move in the world, because when we did that, we, it not only was more expensive than the libraries we'd bought, uh, but it also, um, we also leveraged the company at the time, meaning we borrowed money at that time uh, as a way to possibly enhance the return of our investors by, by leveraging the investment. Uh, so that turned out to be a, a situation where it's an example of both a success and a failure at the same time. So I want to explain what I mean by that. So, uh, and I think I've given you the elements of that. Uh, now I'm going to fast forward to, to today and just kind of jump forward. A lot's happened between there in the last 10 years. It's almost 10 years old, this company now. Um, and in that time, it's, it's grown to be perhaps the largest independent owner of movies and television shows in, in the world owns almost 15,000 individual titles. It distributes DVDs to Walmart and Best Buy and thousands of other stores in the United States and Canada, and it licenses its movies and TV shows in virtually every country in the world. Uh, and so it has considerable cash flow. But remember I said the way how when we bought that DVD company, we, we leveraged the business, and at the same time that the DVD market was kind of going down, well, that, what happened is that meant that the company was over leveraged. And it was, there was a period of time when it, um, 
when it, it was in difficulty because it had trouble paying back its debt and meeting its obligations under its debt, in which case it got uh, refinanced multiple times, which changed the equity structure of the business. Um, but the business kept growing at the same time. So today we have a business that is a $100 million business, $100 million in year revenues, $28 million in cash flow, uh, and it's not worth very much because the amount that it's worth is almost equal to the amount of the debt. Okay, so we made progress in paying down the debt, but it was leveraged so, so much, it should, in other words, the investment between equity and debt should have been a little different than what it was. So in that sense, the financing, and sometimes it's a guess about what the right ratio is, but the financing turns out in retrospect to have been a mistake. Um, Starting the business, it's hard to say it's a mistake because a hundred million dollar business with 28 million dollars in cash flow, that's pretty darn good and it does that year after year. In fact, it's still growing. Um, and so in that case, um, we got both a successful company, but it, it's not returning any value to the investors yet because it was over leveraged. Kind of an odd situation. However, in everything, there is still opportunity. And today, just at 3.30 today, I got an email from the company uh, informing me that, um, that the, one of the major lenders is going to be bought out at a discount. And with that, they will be turning over their, their equity back to the company. And therefore, those of, who are remaining equity owners, the value of their shares is going to rise overnight once that deal closes. This is very good news. This is opportunity that, uh, that gives new life to the company. So um, I just wanted to share that story to you because I think it's an example of all three parts what you're going to be talking about today. Success, failure, and opportunity all in one fell swoop. And that's a company that is right here. Uh, it's technically in Needham, but it's right on the Needham-Newton line. Uh, it's a headquarters that now has major operations in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and Los, and Los Angeles, hundreds of employees. So with that, I want to say welcome to our speakers, welcome to Mayor Warren, uh, and welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, President Alexander. This is an individual who's working absolutely an incredible amount to connect the programs that we're doing to our local community. So thank you again. Um, next up, we have a really incredible speaker. I'm happy to uh, present to you the Honorable Mayor Seti Warren. It's always sort of a scary thing when someone says you're an incredible speaker kind of raises the bar. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, it's great to be here at LaSalle um, and uh, really appreciate uh, the leadership and partnership of uh, the President, uh, President Alexander. Thank you very much for hosting um, and being just an incredible partner here in Newton. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the, the uh, President of the uh, uh, Newton Needham Chamber of Co uh, Commerce, uh, Greg Reedman. Um, please, please. Um, Greg's really brought an innovation and energy to the chamber uh, that's been so impressive and uh, we're really proud to partner with him um, on events all through the city to promote uh, the current business uh, that goes on as well as expand others. So thank you, Greg, uh, for your leadership. It's always great to be here with uh, Daryl Settles. Um, and I know you're going to hear from Paul Levy as well, who I think is somewhere. Uh, he's here. There he is, my friend Paul. It's great to see you. Thank you for participating. Um, and Alderman uh, Jay Harney uh, is here, uh, who's uh, a real champion for this, uh, this area, certainly small businesses uh, throughout the city um, as well. Uh, so I just want to say a few words uh, to you on behalf of the city. Uh, we've done a tremendous amount of work in the last couple of years to really make Newton um, a business friendly community. Uh, we've worked hard on listening, we've worked hard on streamlining uh, for businesses uh, that currently exist in Newton so that they can expand, as well as the attempt to be welcoming to business uh, here in this community. We have more work to do. We've got a great staff. I see Amanda Stout there, and um, I'm not sure if from the planning department, uh, but our planning director uh, has real vision about um, expanding economic development and working with business. So the message here tonight is um, to you, 
uh, that we value business, you make Newton successful, uh, not only uh, around expanding the tax base, but really the quality of life in all of our villages. And we understand that, um, and we want to continue to strengthen our relationship um, and make things happen uh, for you. In turn, we'll make things happen for the city of Newton. I'm also pleased uh, that we're here uh, with the regional administrator for SBA, Bob Nelson, uh, who I uh, gave a call to, and um, I appreciate our conversation. He made it clear to me um, pretty quickly that he wanted to make sure that businesses knew that the federal government is also here to be of assistance to small business and also to make it clear uh, that there are emergency tools in uh, the toolbox because of the marathon, the terrible tragedy that occurred. Businesses, particularly around the Suffolk County area, have been affected, but also those have had layers beyond Suffolk County into Middlesex and otherwise. So uh, he, uh, very, in very short order, uh, between conversations between Greg and, and Bob, wanted to give uh, Bob an, an opportunity to make sure that you all knew uh, that, that the uh, SBA uh, had some tools to assist businesses that were affected uh, by the marathon uh, tragedy that occurred a couple of weeks ago. So it's, I'm so pleased that you're here as well, Bob. Um, so thank you. Have a great evening. Uh, you know, this is so fabulous to see the number of people that are here. Uh, we're going to continue to build on, on these types of programs and partner with the Chamber in the future. Thank you. Have a great evening. All right, well, little introduction needed, as Mayor Warren just said. Next up, we have somebody ha here on behalf of the Marathon Disaster Relief for Small Businesses. I would like you guys to join me in welcoming Robert Nelson. Hello, everyone. Uh, always good to be at a Small Business uh, Week celebration, and good to be here with all of you, and appreciate the invitation, uh, Mayor Warren and also Greg Reedman of the Chamber uh, to allow me to be here uh, to talk about the SBA and some of the tools that we have to help uh, small business. Uh, I don't have to tell all of you, because I think most of you have been studying entrepreneurship, but small business is vital to the economy. Uh, small businesses have created two-thirds of the net new jobs over the last decade. Small businesses in this recovery, like previous recoveries, are the ones that are creating the jobs. So uh, as the director of the Small Business Administration for the state of Massachusetts, it's an important job. It's one that I take seriously, and it's one that I think we have been doing some tremendous uh, things here in Massachusetts, which I'm going to uh, share with you. Uh, in just a moment. But for those of you who don't know uh, what the SBA is, the, the Small Business Administration, we're an agency of the federal government. Uh, the mission of the SBA is to foster, preserve, and promote the interest of small business, to strengthen the economy, but most importantly right now, to help create badly needed jobs. And uh, it, it's, it's one that the SBA does uh, through what we call four primary areas, and we call it the three C's and a D. And what I want to talk about first is what I believe is the, the most important C, and that's capital and access to capital. Uh, to show you how big a player the SBA is in the small business loan field, the SBA has a s small business portfolio of about $100 billion across the country, so pretty significant. And I don't have to tell all of you that access to capital is extremely critical for small businesses with uh, helping them get to the next level and with them helping get new customers and reach new markets. Uh, at the SBA, we have a wide array of loan programs to help small businesses with access to capital. Uh, you do need to know that the SBA does not make direct loans through our traditional loan program. What we do is we provide a guarantee to the bank to help them get to the yes decision. And over the last couple years, the SBA, if you look at us na nationwide, we've helped about 125,000 small businesses secure about $60 billion in loans. Uh, All-time record uh, activity for the SBA nationwide. And we've also had all-time records here in Massachusetts. And last year in Massachusetts, we helped about 2,000 small businesses secure about $700 million in capital. 
And I'm extremely proud to, to share with you that right now, uh, there are 68 district offices in the country. Uh, Massachusetts is actually number three out of 68 in terms of loan approvals. And pretty significant when you figure the size of the Massachusetts market compared to other states. So uh, if you're a small business in need of capital in Massachusetts and you need SBA backing, uh, you're in the right place. But uh, I'm here tonight to talk primarily about the D. And what that D stands for is disaster recovery. And most people uh, don't know that the SBA is the disaster loan bank for the United States. Uh, when there's a hurricane, tornadoes, floods, uh, and unfortunately, incidences like the uh, Boston Marathon bombing, the SBA can come to the rescue and to help small businesses to recover. And uh, uh, Governor Patrick asked the SBA to declare a, a disaster declaration as a result of the Boston Marathon bombing. And that declaration came through extremely fast when you figure government. Uh, that declaration came through last Friday. So what that does is it, it opens up low interest, long-term loans to small businesses and nonprofits so that they can try to recover. Uh, the interest rates are 4% fixed for up to 30 years. For nonprofits, the interest rate is 2.875%. Again, it can be fixed for up to uh, 30 years. So extremely affordable payments to try to help small businesses and those nonprofits to recover. And as Mayor Warren uh, mentioned, it, it's not just the 500 businesses that were in that lockdown area, that, that part of Boston that was closed off for a week. Uh, the uh, SBA program is eligible for businesses located here in Newton, Needham, uh, actually all of Suffolk County, Middlesex, Essex, uh, and Norfolk County. So a huge wide area of, of businesses and nonprofits are potentially uh, eligible for this assistance. And so what I'd like all of you to do, if you could, is the SBA has opened up a disaster recovery center. It's at the Boston Public Library in Copley at, at 700 Boylston. And that disaster recovery center will be open through next Friday, uh, normal business hours. It's staffed by the city of Boston, but also SBA disaster personnel. And so if you're a business that has been adversely impacted as a result of that uh, bombing, uh, you, I suggest that you go to that center, uh, talk to the SBA if you have any questions. If you can't get to that center, call us. Call us at the SBA. Uh, we have 800 numbers. My office can help answer some questions. The Small Business Development Center uh, can help uh, answer questions and to provide assistance. But we want to make sure that everyone knows that this assistance is uh, available to try to help people recover uh, from that tragic incident uh, that happened. So again, thank you for the opportunity to share some brief remarks about the SBA uh, and uh, congratulations on the kickoff for uh, Small Business Month. Thank you very much. All right, quickly before we take a turn here in kind of our direction of events, I just want to quickly say thank you again to these three individuals who are absolutely doing amazing things for us as a community and for this college in general. So just quickly one more time, join me in a round of applause for everybody that's been out here tonight. All right, thank you very much. Now, now we're going to take a quick turn. Um, I would like to welcome an individual who's here to talk about a little bit his own experiences with small business. Um, Paul Levy has come to join us to talk a little bit about his experience with sports, healthcare, and the government industries. Uh, recently, he acted as president and CEO of Beth Israel Dakonas. He was also the executive dean of administration at Harvard Medical School. And he's, I believe, currently taking on the role of executive director in the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Paul Levy. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, as mentioned, um, although I'm a small business owner now, which is to say a sole proprietorship of myself, um, in the past I've run some rather large businesses. The most recent one was Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which is one of the large academic teaching uh, hospitals in Boston with a, an annual budget of $1.4 billion. Uh, I'd like to report that my sole proprietorship is close to that, but I think we need to give it a few years to see where it develops. 
I'd like to talk about a couple of things today, recognizing we have a, um, a highly uh, varied audience from people who are just starting out to people who've been accomplished business people and public servants for many years. I'd like to start talking a little bit about the healthcare environment and what to expect and the ramifications of that environment for those of you who are running businesses today and for those of you who will be shortly. Um, and then I'd like to turn from that to some personal experience and some recent work that I've been doing. So you'll all recall that <clears throat> a couple years ago when President Obama proposed a national health care reform bill, he promised us three things in that legislation. He promised us that people throughout the country would have access to health care, which is to say they would have insurance, whereas many of them uh, did not. For example, in Texas, only uh, uh, fully 25% of the people in Texas did not have health insurance. One in three business owners in New Mexico did not have health insurance for themselves and their employees. And that was a national disgrace, that people shouldn't have access to insurance. So he promised us access. But recognizing people's concerns about what that would mean, he also promised us that we would continue to have choice among the doctors and hospitals that we would use, because that was a politically sensitive area. And the third thing he promised us would be that there would be cost control, that the ever-rising cost of health care would, uh, would moderate. Well, uh, as well-intentioned as he is as a president, the problem with what he pr promised us is you can't get all three of those things. You get any two of the three. You get access, you get lower costs, you lose choice, and vice versa. Nonetheless, the bill passed, and the bill is a monumental bill that will provide for health care insurance for virtually everybody in America. It follows on a similar bill that Massachusetts had passed several years before. And the experience we've had in Massachusetts and the country as a whole suggests the following, um, notwithstanding everybody's good intentions. If we look at the underlying demographics of the country and of the state, here's what the population looks like to those of us who have run hospitals. One, the elderly, the elderly are living longer many, many years longer, and they need hospitalization and medical care more than they used to, simply because they're living longer. The baby boomers, people in my generation, the most narcissistic generation in history, I would say, the most de demanding and entitled, although you can try to catch up with us over time, um, are now at the age of needing hospitalization for the first time. But also, we have very high expectations. If I hurt my knee playing soccer or playing tennis, in my 60s, I fully expect to get it fixed and to be able to play for another 20 years. My parents and my grandparents, if they were playing soccer, which they wouldn't have been, but if they had hurt themselves playing basketball <clears throat> or tennis, would have said, oh, I have a sore knee, I'll just go through life with a sore knee. We expect to be fixed. And then the next generation coming along is suffering from obesity because of a sedentary lifestyle. And there, the sequela, the follow-on from obesity is diabetes and various other diseases that come from that. So if you think about it that way, if you're in the hospital business, this should be a growth industry time. It should be great. We've got three, sect, three cohorts in society all coming along who want more medical services. The problem is we can't afford it. The problem is we can't afford it. So there are going to be a lot of cost pressures on the system. Now, what does this mean if you're running a small business or about to start a small business? You've got these trends coming along, higher costs, less choice, problems. Well, it means that you, in running your business, have to make some decisions about the kind of health care service you want to provide to your employees. And there are some things you can do to control your health care costs. I'm going to mention two. One is the concept of limited networks of care. This gets to the choice issue, I'm afraid to say. You need to understand that in a metropolitan area like Boston, there are some hospitals and physicians who get paid more by insurance companies because they have more market power. In the Boston area, it's the partner's healthcare system, which gets paid substantially more. Mass General, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Newton Wellesley Hospital, and the like, get paid more because they have a huge network and they have leverage over the insurance companies and get paid more. Then there are other hospitals like Beth Israel Deaconess, Tufts Medical Center, um, uh, BID Needham, 
um, that are just as good quality, but they get paid less because they have le less uh, market power vis-a-vis -vis the insurance companies. You as a purchaser of insurance now get to choose because there are c companies offering, like Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, offering plans that say if you're willing to have a limited choice for the people in your plan to use the lower cost but equally high quality hospitals, we'll charge you less for insurance. So there's a choice you get to make for yourself and your employees. Your choice, you have to decide one way or the other if it's worthwhile. The other choice you need to make is how you're going to charge for health insurance in your business. If the insurance companies have their way, here's what they want you to do. They want you to give a discounted premium to the family plans in your business, for the people on family plans, and charge disproportionately more to people, to singles in your business. Why is that? Why is that? Well, the deep dark secret, which isn't so deep dark, is that insurance companies make more money from sick people than from well people. The more claims that you submit for your business, for your employees, the better the insurance company comes, goes. So they, they will offer you pricing plans and suggestions in your business that actually encourage people to take the family plan through your insurance offering rather than taking the family plan that might be offered by the spouse of your employee. I know this sounds so unintuitive, counterintuitive, but what do you want to do in return? You actually want to price your plan more rationally. If older people with bigger families actually are higher risk in terms of medical care, you want to charge proportionally more for their premium to them. And likewise, less for singles. What does that mean? What does that mean? What are you trying to do? This will sound so unintuitive and unfair that you're going to say he's crazy. Well, what it does is it actually encourages that married couple with two children when they're sitting around the table during open enrollment, comparing the two plans of their two employers, they want to go to the one that's subsidized more than the other. And you want them to do that because you want your high-risk employees to be covered by another firm and not your firm. The insurance companies don't tell you this when they're selling you their product and giving you their advice. So there are some things you can do <clears throat> as a business owner to help control your health care costs. There are other things you can do, of course, in terms of wellness programs and the like. Probably the best thing you can do to control your health care costs is to hire young people. But you don't always have that, that choice. So those are just two, so two thoughts for those in established businesses and those starting out new businesses about how to think about uh, health care costs um, in the future. I now want to turn to, to my business, um, my sole proprietorship, which is uh, I'm an author, I write books, and I give talks uh, around the world on various issues. And, uh, and there are two books that I want to mention. This is in the nature of marketing right now, in case you're missing this. Never miss an opportunity to market, got this? Um, one book is actually a book about leadership, about corporate leadership, and it's, it's based on the time I've spent here and on the man, many playing, yes, here in this room, in Winslow Hall, and around the many playing fields of Newton, coaching girls soccer at Newton Girls Soccer. We actually used to have practices in this room over and over again. I think they finally stopped us because we kept breaking windows or something like that. Um, and I wrote a book called Goal Play. It's called Goal Play Leadership Lessons from the Soccer Field. And uh, it's based on the idea that what, what makes a good coach in sports also makes good leaders in business. As a leader in a business, um, you are a coach to the people working in that, in that business. And it, there are implications in terms of management style and approach that I talk about in the book. The other book I want to talk about is, a, is a emblematic of the fact that the world has changed with regard to social media and the power of social media in terms of marketing, framing issues, and proceeding with your business in a way that's successful. The particular book is called, it's called How a Blog Held Off the Most Powerful Union in America. This was about a union organizing campaign, a, a corporate campaign, run by the Service Employees International Union against our hospital, in which they were trying through advertisements and other things to denigrate the reputation of our hospital to make it easier to organize the hospital. 
we, we didn't have nearly as much money as they had. We didn't have the resources they had to fight this off. But what we had was a blog that I was writing in which I was exposing what they were doing as they were doing it. And the end result was that they failed um, in, in, their, in their campaign. As I say, it's emblematic of the power of social media in framing what your business is about, what you're trying to accomplish, and gives you tools to use against competition or adverse forces. Um, I'm not permitted to sell these books in this room, um, but I am permitted to sell them outside later. And my, my lovely wife, Frazana, will have some available. Here's the deal for today. If you're a student, I'll sell them to you at my cost, which is five bucks. If you're not a student, 10, okay? Um, and um, and I, obviously you don't need to buy them, but uh, I hope you do. And I ho if you like them, I also hope you'll, hope you'll post a review on Amazon about them. And if you don't like them, I hope you'll forget I asked you to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Levy. So it seems to me as the MC, I have made a cardinal mistake in being an MC. I completely overlooked one of our welcoming speakers. Um, so on behalf of myself, I would like to say sorry. And while I have you guys welcome, Mr. Greg Reibman, the president of the Newton Needham Chamber of Commerce. Well, hi, everybody. No worries there. Uh, this is fantastic. Thank you all for being here. And if you haven't had a chance when you came in, do take time to look at the posters around the walls. There's some really great ideas, and it's uh, really inspiring. And congratulations to all the students who did that, and thanks to the college for hosting this. Um, my name is Greg Reedman, and I am president of your Chamber of Commerce. And the your is really important, and I want to make sure you understand that. For example, did you know that LaSalle is a member of the Chamber, which means that everyone in the LaSalle community is part of this Chamber. Uh, this year, we were lucky enough to uh, partner with, with the college on a few different things. Professor Weka, who was here somewhere, we partnered on a different event earlier, and we're doing this one. We're pleased to do that. Uh, we've had a fantastic intern, uh, Bailey Mason, who was somewhere in the room who worked with us uh, this year. Uh, we've had a couple other people from the, I think it's uh, four fantastic people from the hospitality program who were helping us with some of our events. And uh, for the businesses here, there's a whole intern program that you ought to check out at LaSalle because there's really a great opportunity and really fantastic students with lots of great energy. So uh, do check that out. Now also the town of Needham and the city of Newton are members of the Chamber of Commerce. So uh, Seti Warren, mayor of Newton, is also a member of the Chamber of Commerce. Amanda Stout, the economic development planner of the city, is a member of the Chamber. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of other 500 businesses in total and, and 500 different kinds and different kinds of businesses. Uh, for example, lots of banks. Eastern Bank, our sponsor today, and want to thank uh, Bill Balboni, who's here somewhere, for uh, sponsoring. And also uh, and Susan Paley, who is here from the Village Bank, which is our platinum sponsor. Uh, and there's a lot of other businesses, everything in the real estate business, nonprofits, hospitals, colleges, all part of this thing called the Chamber of Commerce, your Chamber of Commerce. So now you're wondering, all right, what does my Chamber of Commerce do? Uh, which is a common question that I get asked a lot. And uh, what your Chamber of Commerce does is three different things. Think about it this way. We have networking opportunities for our members to meet and interact with each other and um, learn from each other and do business with each other. And we have, the summer is the best time to do the networking for the Chamber because we have a lot of fun things. We'll meet at the pool, the Hotel Indigo, over drinks and, and network, presumably. Uh, we're going to go to Fenway Park this year as a, and, and have breakfast at Fenway Park overlooking the field. Uh, we also meet for breakfast a lot and, and uh, informal things around the evening in a restaurant or whatever. So there's all this networking and opportunities to get together. Uh, we have educational events, such as this one. Uh, we have an educational event next week, a week from today, uh, entitled How to Do Business in Newton and Needham. So if you're thinking about that and want to know kind of the rules and regulations or opportunities uh, in the, either Newton or Needham, check that one out next Thursday. So there's the educational component. Uh, and then we have, um, finally, our advocacy, which is a really big part, an important part of what we do. And our advocacy is really about either lobbying on your behalf in front of municipalities or the state um, for regulations that are matter and things that are important, um, or also making sure that consumers know the value of doing business here. So we did a big shop local campaign uh, this past year, and we'll do that again this year. Uh, we also are doing, on Monday night, we're serving dinner to 500 people with rep food from 400 of our restaurants, and it's all about bringing the restaurants together and exposing the, uh, 
the value of dining locally and eating locally in our community. So that's just an example of what we do. Uh, finally, I wanted to just acknowledge both of our speakers here and, and say how excited to have them both here. Uh, Paul and Daryl, people that I greatly admire. And what's, what's great about them and what's indicative of the kind of spirit we try to, we have in this community is while they both have really big, have had really big jobs and working in the city, Paul's run a hospital, he was responsible for the water we, we drink. Uh, Daryl's run, run some really cool restaurants in the city. Uh, he's in real estate development, does all these kinds of things. Both of them have taken time to give back to this community in their own unique ways. Literally, there was Paul when he was a president of the hospital, I would see him on the soccer field when my kid was out there coaching soccer. And he, when um, a few years back, he led an effort um, to analyze the city's finances, part of the Blue Ribbon Commission. And if Mayor Warren was still here, uh, he'd tell you how important that was as a roadmap when he became mayor uh, with the Blue Ribbon Commission. Did. And Daryl is doing this now, even though he's got all these big important things that happen in the city, he's serving as our economic development commissioner. And I think that's really important. And thank you both of you for your service. And thank you all for being here. And uh, President Alexander, thank you for hosting in the college. Have a great night. Thank you again, President Radman. Now we're going to take a shift into a presentation of one of our student events. But before we do that, I would like to ask Nancy Waldron to come up and discuss our review system for these different rubrics. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. All right. So now we're going to get into our student groupings. Uh, I would like to welcome from Professor Potterine's Hospitality and Event Management Seminar um, a really unique business plan that a group of girls have developed and spent a lot of time developing. Um, so if you guys would please join me in welcoming Amy, Bridget, and Lindsay from Dream Girls Brewery. Connective learning philosophy at LaSalle College allows us, the students, to capture the value that we create in the classroom by challenging us to apply that to our own career goals, ambitions, and dreams. Over the past four years, I have made it my mission to explore my passions related to the hospitality industry and the world of sustainability and put these concepts to work. Together, Amy, Bridget, and myself have used our senior capstone project to turn my re years of research and our years of LaSalle education into a business plan. The mission of the business is to have excellent beers, delicious food, and an empowered staff. But the underlying theme of this business is to showcase a story of an American dream reinvented with more modern values such as sustainability, supporting local businesses, and fa the farm to table concept. We now present to you Dream Girl Brewery and Pub. Okay, so today we're gonna tell you about our company as a whole. We'll start by telling you about the Dream Girl way. Trends in the craft beer and food industry, the Dream Girl experience, marketing and promotional efforts, and America's Dream Girl. So Dream Girl Brewery and Pub strives to elevate the classics of both food and beer. We'll do this with high quality, local, fresh ingredients in a playful, innovative way. Some of the values that we aspire to have is to empower our employees, use the freshest local ingredients as possible, operate with sustainability in mind, and be involved in our community. Each of our beer styles will be characterized by one of our dream girls, 
For example, the blonde ale will be characterized by a retro style woman with blonde hair. The location that we have selected is Woodstock, Connecticut, located in the northeast corner of Connecticut, which is also referred to as the Last Green Valley. In this location, there's ample amounts of opportunity to work with other local suppliers, such as farmers, dairy farmers, fruit orchards, and many more. So for trends in the industry, as you can see from the graphic, the craft beer industry is growing extremely well over the last several years. An example of a craft beer that you might know is something like Sam Adams or Wachusett Brewery. So over just the last year, the industry itself has grown 18%, which is a huge number. As you can see, the market share has also increased. Although it's a smaller number, it's a number that is starting to compete with bigger people such as Budweiser and Coors Light. There's also some trends in terms of lifestyle. So people are much more engaged with the food that they're, eat, that they're eating and engaged in a more healthy lifestyle. Our dream goal will have a few facilities. We will be having a brewery facility. We will be having our pub and restaurant. We will be having brewery tours. We will also be having a tasting room, which will be also used as our event space. And then we will be having a retail space. Our Dream Girl products will be having three full-time beers. We will be having a, um, an IPA beer, which is a, a crispy beer with, um, with the highest alcohol content. Then we, that will be a citrus flavor. Then we will be having a blonde ale, which is our, it's our lightest beer with a crispy, um, refreshing taste. That will be having um, a fruitier taste. Then we have our porter beer, which is our darkest beer. Then we, that will have a, a smoky flavor. That, will um, be a cho with a chocolate hint. Then we'll be having seasonal beers, which will be done quarterly. That will, that's a way that we can have um, our brewery have an experiment with taste of flavors. Our menu will be um, el an elevated comfort food. That will be, uh, we will be having our delicious burger. Our burger will be the best burger because we will be having our beef that will be from the local farm down the street that is um, grass green, grass fed, yeah. Thank you. And then our buns will be delivered daily from our daily uh, from the bakery down the street. That will be topped off with our homemade ketchup with a kick. Then we will be having beer cocktails. Our co on our menu, we'll be having a beer cocktail. Our favorite one would be the cherry barita. That is with equal parts of margarita mix, tequila, our cherry soda, with our blonde ale, and with garnished with a cherry and a lime. And for our desserts, we'll be having a seasonal dessert menu. That will be, we will be having our American apple pie, and we will also be having, if you are in the sharing mood, you can get a, 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 t a plate of our freshly baked um, chocolate chip cookies. Our Dream Girl team is made up of Jillian, who is the CEO, me, Bridget, who is the VP in restaurant, will be the VP of the restaurant operations, then Amy will be the VP of the event and marketing operations. We will also have to hire a um, an experienced head brewer. And our staff will have to go um, through training, which will be our beer one-on-one -on -one certification. That way we know that our um, staff will know their, what they are selling. So for our market research, we did both primary and secondary research. For primary research, we developed a survey and distributed it in person and via social media. We had 70, 47 respondents and these participants ranged, ranged in ages from 21 to 40, most coming from the New England area. The trends that we found with purchasing behavior, we found that um, the following values were really important, sustainability, fresh and local ingredients, and supporting local businesses. Furthermore, we found that word of mouth, brand image, and the design of the packaging were key factors as well. There's also an increased willingness to pay um, for higher quality products and services. With our secondary research, we decided to join the Brewers Association, which gave us access to a vast amount of industry data and trends. Brand image. Our marketing research led us to find that brand image is crucial to the purchasing behavior in the craft beer industry. So we decided to go with a classic retro pinup to represent us as a brand, as America's dream girl. 
Her role is to tell our story, communicate the values of our company, and connect with the woman market and our community as a whole. For the design, we would like to go with a local artist who will portray um, our images into a vintage classic uh, uh, print, similar to the one on the right on the top. Promotional efforts will have two main initiatives, the in-house initiatives and social media marketing. We have one dream girl to represent each beer type, and these are inspired by classic pinups um, of the 1950s. And with this, each dream girl will be represented on the beer tap handles so that you'll see the image and associate it with the beer. Um, our employees will all have classic polished uniforms and our retail outlet will sell t-shirts and other merchandise with our logo. And lastly, we will have beer dinners to promote our food, but also to educate our customers on beer and food pairings. For social media, our blog is going to be a huge piece in terms of communicating our story, really letting our customers in the community know who we are and what we're about and where we came from. Um, also, we will have Twitter. So we will have one username for our company which we'll use to promote all of our events, um, inform our customers when we'll be releasing new beers, and let them know when we'll be having events. We'll also have a unique username for our America's Dream Girl. As you can see on the bottom, Lucy's tweeting to our customers to really connect with them, teach the women how to drink beer in a classy way, and um, really just communicate with our community as a whole. And here are a couple examples. For Facebook, that will be a better outlet for community, communicating with our customers and potential customers, letting them know, again, who we are in a different way. And Instagram will be great for doing weekly promotions and contests. We could do photo contests where we'll use the hashtag to connect back to our brewery and let people know about our new beers. For example, this is the Betsy Blonde on the right which will be perfect for, this image is perfect for connecting with our women market. In conclusion, Dream Girl Brewery and Pub is a premier destination for craft beers and delicious fresh local food. We would like to thank you all for your attention. We apologize for the minor technical difficulties that we experienced, and a special thank you to our Dream Girl, Professor Laura Donna. Thank you very much, girls. Um, next up, we're going to bring up another one of our speakers from outside of the cell community, um, here to talk about a little bit about his experience creating unique events and establishments in the hospitality industry. Um, the newly elected chamber, of, or excuse me, chairman of the Newton Economic Development uh, Commission. Please welcome Mr. Daryl Settles. Please. Good afternoon. I have to change my topic. <laughs> so I was actually wanting to speak a little bit about the EDC, the Economic Development Commission, and also about entrepreneurship versus um, just standard, the operations of the hospitality industry. But first I want to say that I have had a cocktail that has vodka and light beer in it, half and half, and it's very, very, very good. So good evening, everyone. Uh, the mayor has left, but other public officials that are in the audience, President Alexander, Paul, good to see you again, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to be here this evening for a couple of reasons. First, that I'm alive and healthy. With all that's going on, the turmoil throughout the world, we all should feel thankful that we are here and healthy. Secondly, I'm happy because I'm a, I am a member of a thriving community that consists of good, hardworking, understanding, and smart neighborhood village center residents. Newton is a remarkable community, and as you know, it has been voted as one of the best 10 communities to live by several publications in lists. The city's 18.3 square miles, Bordering on the communities of Brookline, Brighton, Watertown, Waltham, Wellesley, Weston, Needham, and West Roxbury has a population of about 80,000 residents and approximately 26,000 homes. 
We pride ourselves on becoming a better and better business-friendly city. We are actively working to ensure that all of our village centers and commercial corridors are sustainable, vibrant places by supporting small business owners, revitalizing our cherished village centers, expanding the city's commercial tax base, and working proactively with developers who want to locate and relocate mixed-use developments in Newton. Our mayor is focused on this and actually has a point person for this outreach. Amanda Stout is in the audience. Amanda is the city's senior economic development planner. And Amanda, raise your hand. Thank you. <laughs> Newton and all business communities are currently facing tough challenges. We are beginning to come out of the toughest recession of at least my generation. I believe the businesses that have survived are strong and have the opportunity to excel over the next few years with distinct planning and execution. We all must plan for the long term and embrace innovative innovation whenever it can make us better. And together as a team, we can help the entire Newton community live up to its full potential. Our city's government mission is to partner with Newton's residents, businesses, and organizations and a sustained campaign to enhance the quality of life in each of our 13 villages, which includes facilitating short-term projects and special events that contribute to long-term goals of the beautification, safety, and livability of this city. The Economic Development Commission itself was established by the city ordinance with the mission to promote and develop business and industry for the purpose of strengthening the local economy providing jobs, and again, expanding the city's tax base. The Commission's work includes promoting, assisting, and encouraging assisting in new businesses, the industries, and commerce in the city of Newton, and advises and make recommendations to the city officials and staff. Examples of some of the changes we support and recommend are, one, excuse me, I'm sure there's some bankers in the room, but we want to limit the number of banks and financial services in our villages and keeping them out of premier ground floor locations, only for a certain period of time. As you know, when you go drive throughout our villages, you see in some of them we have more than 15 um, financial services operations. They do not bring the traffic we need in our communities to thrive. Also, they're one of the reasons that rents are so high, which limits a lot of other needed retail. Two, we are opposed to MBTA's proposed fare increases and service cuts to the transit system. However, we do support a 25% across the board fare increase and would like to have the operating hours be increased to 2 or 3 a.m. to serve the, the access and mobility needs of transit dependent populations, particularly those working situations who rely upon this transit system. We support keeping a transparent, fair, consistent, and predictable process of issuing licenses. We want the city to be perceived and be a friendly place to do business and one that is an innovative and open to new ideas. Four, we are working to enhance current parking and zoning regulations to encourage pedestrian use and create vibrant mixes of stores, restaurants, and other uses. Five. We want the city to embrace biotechnology as a key industry in our city's future by amending the current zoning ordinance to allow as of right biotech laboratories and manufacturing in existing manufacturing industrial zones and potentially others as well. Six, we support the concept of hiring a business development officer to engage on city marketing, recruitment, and business development. Seven, we support the need for inclusionary zoning and will continue to work with the Newton Housing Partnership. And eight, we are working with and providing feedback to the Planning Committee and Department on the implementation fund design for Needham Street. Some of the marketing and outreach activities we are facilitating are, one, our annual Excellent Award Ceremony, which began just this last October and was a total success with over 200 attendees. The ceremony was to celebrate and acknowledge the businesses that have made a significant contribution to the city and to foster goodwill between the city and the business community. 
Two, we are working to produce a new promotional map for the city that will highlight our restaurants and other attractions. We should be proud and support, and I highlight and support, the significant increase in the number of quality restaurants and bars we now have throughout our villages. Please note, more are coming, and we want them all. We want and need Newton not, to be a, not only to be a safe community to raise kids and educate them, but a thriving evening community with restaurants, bars, and entertainment. We are beginning to see a lot more of that in Chestnut Hill, and our courage that it will begin to happen more fully in other centers like Newtonville, Newton Center, Newton Hollands, West Newton, Nonantum, and possibly other village centers. We say, bring on the active and attractive sidewalk cafes. We say, bring on more restaurants with mature bar scenes. We say, bring on the food trucks. We say, bring on the festivals and entertainment to our neighborhoods. Let's not let the South End, the Four Point Channel, and Boston's new waterfront have all the business and still our residents. Number three, work closely with the Board of Aldermen and the Planning um, Department for the development of high interest areas and projects like the Austin Street lot in Newtonville, Riverside, Chestnut Hill Square projects, Needham Street, and Newton Center. Four, we want to work with many of the larger villages and develop individual mini business plans. We think each community should try to come together and develop their own needs assessments of their community with a three to five year plan. We believe that these plans will help facilitate a better growth strategy and drive businesses to invest in themselves as they plan to compete. Five, we are studying and evaluating the idea of launching a shop local campaign. Number six, we will continue to use the information we gather from the economic development assessment tool which is a tool we use in partnership with Northeastern University's Dukaka Center for Urban Research and Policy and the National League of Cities. It provided us with an integrated view of how various departments and stakeholders affect economic development and their roles in creating a business-friendly environment. From my earlier comments, I want to acknowledge that the EDC's four focus areas are, one, marketing, promotion, and communication, two, village centers growth, three, developing our corridors, Needham Street, Route 9, Washington Street, and four, small business development. We would do this by building on new strengths in the regional economy and focus on enhancing amenities. We will continue our work to intensify development and encourage development at appropriate and critical sites. Before I close, and because we are also here to discuss the challenges of small businesses, I have found two short related lists that I would like to share on being successful with your business development strategies. First, nine things that successful people do differently. One, get specific when setting goals. Two, seize the moment to act on your goals. Decide when and where. Three, know exactly how far you have to go. Constant monitoring of your progress. Number four, be a realistic optimist. Optimist. Most goals worth achieving require time, planning, effort, and persistence. Five, focus on getting better rather than getting good. Six, have grit. The willingness to commit to long-term goals and persist in the face of difficulty. Number seven, build your willpower muscle. Do 100 sit-ups a day, something I have to work on. Number eight, don't tempt fate. Successful people know not to make reaching a goal harder than it already is. Number nine, focus on what you will do, not what you won't do. And then um, last list is five myths and one absolute truth about entrepreneurship. One, you get to do more of what you love. No, your job as an entrepreneur is not to do one thing, it's to run a business. All functions, marketing, accounting, operations, banking, the list. Number two, you're the boss. There's no boss. Number three, the business is about you. No, you are in business to serve a need. Number four, it's easy. No, businesses take a long time to build and it's called work for a reason. Number five, you can equals you should. 
No, just because you can does not mean you should. Now the one truth, the rule of three. It takes three times longer than it should. Will cost three times what you have budgeted. And will be three times more difficult to execute than expected. Now the good news, if your business plan includes this worst case scenario and it still wins, works, and makes a lot of money, please call me. I might be able to find a few friendly investors for you. <laughs> Seriously, I want to thank you for your time and thank you for listening. All right, thank you very much again. Uh, just a quick little note. Uh, if there's any small business owners in the room that are here that would like to look for interns, we're looking for people to fill job positions. Um, we have a list set up out back for you guys to go sign up with. Through that list, we will basically find qualified students to fulfill any needs that you guys may have and or want. Um, so if there are any small business owners or anybody in the room that's looking for things like that, please see Kelly Buckley in the back. She will be right out by the food until this event is over. Um, and that is that on that. So if there's anybody looking, please do go see her. We've got a lot of talent in this school and it is an awesome opportunity for both us and you. Uh, next up, uh, from Professor Awaika's market research class, uh, we have a group of students who has a project to come show you the strengths and weaknesses that they've been identifying in small businesses, like the event, the project is called The Dynamics of Small Business in a Changing Environment, so you guys please come up. So we represent Professor Iweka's Business 420 Marketing Research class, and this is our marketing research project titled The Dynamics of Small Business in a Changing Environment. So from day one, we learned that this was not going to be your average traditional class that we've taken here at LaSalle. We actually only met in the classroom, uh, in the classes leading up to spring break, and then after spring break, we actually went out into the field and um, then started to conduct our research. So in the beginning, we were told that we were to select an industry and then use local businesses that are in that chosen industry to create a um, research project. And we were divided into two teams. Uh, one team made up of myself, Chris, and other members in the crowd uh, chose the restaurant industry. And we uh, chose to focus more on sit-down restaurants that were privately owned, uh, independently owned, I'm sorry. And uh, we define these as restaurants that you could sit down and consume your meal, and they also had a waiter, a waitress, and a host or hostess. And we wanted to choose those because we didn't want to include uh, fast food or larger chains. So our research question was uh, the dynamics of a small business in a changing environment. The first objective was to determine the available financial resources. And by doing this, we wanted to see how small businesses are able to find funding and to see if there were any patterns um, throughout the industries. The second objective was to determine the impact of the recession on growth rate. And we wanted to see if uh, small businesses uh, see if they're able to expand in the near future or if the recession has eliminated this possibility. And the third objective was to determine the, um, if small businesses have a five-year plan. Um, and this was because we wanted to see if they were able to look into the future right now or if it's more on a day-to-day -day basis. So for the sample selections, um, we, for restaurants, selected um, Newton and Waltham, a radius of two miles we found a population of about 300. And we realized that with our time constraint for only this uh, semester, we had to narrow this down and we chose a sample size of about 150. And we used uh, Main Street in Waltham, Woody Street in Waltham, and Washington Street in Newton. And all restaurants that we chose must have fit the criteria that we defined before.
So for the methodology, uh, each uh, first we were we had to come up as a group with a questionnaire, and this questionnaire was then um, approved by Professor Iweka. After it was approved, each member was assigned a territory or a street, and then after that territory was assigned, uh, we would use transportation to get to these locations and conduct personal interviews. Um, during the personal interview, the questionnaire would be given to the manager or owners, and then if they had any questions, they could ask there. We also left our phone number so they could call us afterwards. Uh, the dates were between March 27th and April 19th, and by April 19th, all uh, surveys had to be returned to us. For the restaurant industry, we had 83 of the 150 returned, which was approximately 55%. And for the salon industry, they had 46 returned, which was approximately 57.5%. Uh, and it was 46 returned because when we went out to the field, we realized that one in every eight businesses were closed down or didn't fit our criteria. So we actually ended up sampling about 80 businesses, which gave, when we got 46 back, which gave us a 57.5%. After all surveys were returned to us, uh, the information that we gathered was then uh, entered in the Survey Monkey, and we were able to analyze it further. <laughs> So for our first objective, we went to go on to find the, determine the available financial resources in the area. And we found that the majority of the small restaurants went after private loans or personal funding that they used. A very small amount used grants and government loans. So then we found our second question was, um, sorry, I was aware of all the options above for obtaining startup money and we found that a majority of these small businesses restaurants found that they were not all aware of all of them whether it was just from the start or just basically knew of loans and their own startup money so for our third um, we found that was it obtaining a loan whether it was uh, a local or a government loan was it challenging and most companies found as you can see around almost 50 percent found that it was challenging a very small portion found that it wasn't, which is only about 12.2%, as you can see. So for our analysis for that objective, we found that majority, majority of these businesses were not aware of all, aware of all the options. Uh, this resulted possibly in making it challenging to obtain a loan. Uh, we found that in Newton, when you're about to start a business, they do give you handouts. They tell you all the information that you need to know. A lot of the businesses that we actually went to around Moody Street and Main Street and Waltham, and a lot of those businesses, we believe, were the ones who di weren't aware. In Waltham, you aren't given uh, pieces of paper and telling you where you can get loans, how to obtain startup money at all. The only available options would be to go online. So for, this, oh, hello. Uh, for the salon industry, we found out that the majority, 56.5%, used personal funding to start up their business. Then 34.8% used private loans, and only 87 used small business grants to start up their businesses. And then when we asked about if they were aware of all their options, an overwhelming majority of 81.9% were aware, and only 4.5% were unaware. Then when we asked them if obtaining the loan was challenging, the biggest one was not applicable, but that was because they used personal funding and didn't get a loan. Um, of those that did get a loan, 34.8, uh, uh, not 34.8, 43.59 uh, obtained loans uh, were found that they were challenging, and 21.7 felt that they weren't challenging to get a loan. So for analysis, the majority used personal funding. Only a few were not aware, aware of their options. And then it was kind of mixed reviews with if the loan was challenging or not, skewing towards not being challenging to get a loan. OK, so for objective two uh, was to determine the impact of the recession on growth rate with the restaurant injury. Uh, industry during the first statement that they had to um, rate on a strongly disagree to strongly agree was during the recession my sales decreased 
as you can see from the graphic, 54.9% said they agree or strongly agree that their sales had decreased, and 29.2% said that they either dis disagreed or strongly disagreed. Obviously, in a recession, uh, the consumer is going to have less disposable income, and going out to eat at a restaurant is more of a luxury than it is a necessity. So that obviously is going to play in effect. But also, if you drive down Moody Street or if you go to Main Street, you will find a lot of uh, franchise chains such as McDonald's or Burger King. And during a recession, these companies, uh, these other businesses really market things like the dollar menu. And that's really hard for a small mom and pop restaurant to uh, compete with because they don't have the uh, resources available to them to um, do that. The second statement was, after the recession, my sales increased. 48.7% uh, agreed, and 30.5% said that they disagreed or strongly disagreed. Independent restaurants uh, around here are optimistic. We believe that this has to do with the high income in Newton uh, area, because one thing that they say is that um, what they notice is that a lot of their customers are repeat customers. They really push uh, their service and they're able to build relationships with the customers in the area, so they feel that even with the recession, they're gonna be able to get back on their feet and start to see an increase in sales. So for the analysis of Objective 2 for restaurants, uh, we saw that, what well, we found with further research that the median income in the Newton area jumped from 86,000 to 108,000 in 2009, and then 2010 it jumped again to 112,000 and that's in comparison to the state, which was a median income of about 70,000. Um, this goes with uh, the trend that we've noticed that total number of restaurant visits is actually going down, but because uh, these uh, companies in this industry locally are in such a good area, we believe that they will be able to combat this trend and remain afloat. So this is objective two for salon industries. And we realized that 41.3% of companies here in Newton were directly impacted by the recession. And 34.8% uh, answered not applicable, so they might have not known if they were directly impacted by the recession or not. And then 23.9% disagreed that the sales decreased during the recession. So the recession had no impact on their sales. Objective two, after the recession, my sales have improved. 51.1% answered neutral, and this is because, it might be because, during the months the sales fluctuate, so they might have an increase in their sales one month and a decrease in their sales the next month, so they're not really sure if, they're, if they've improved or not. And 6.7% uh, answered they have not seen any improvement in their sales. So our analysis is that the majority of companies were, um, sales were directly impacted by the recession, and our secondary research shows that a lot of companies' sales decrease during a recession because they take money out of their marketing and advertising expenses. So this, way, this not allows them to directly get in touch with a customer base, so they're not getting to their customers, so they're not, so the customers don't know they're out there. And, oh. um, their sales improved after the recession because the annual household income of Newton residents also increased, so people are going out and spending more money after that. So for our third objective, we wanted to find out if these small businesses have a five-year plan established as of now. So of course, the first question we asked was, do you have a five-year plan? So we found that an overwhelming majority, around 70%, said that they did not have a five-year plan, whether in mind or even written down. So for the small percentage that did around uh, 21.9% who answered yes. They tried to, they wanted to improve their resources and hire more employees, which, you know, hiring more employees is what we need around here, which gives it a good outlook, that we can see. But the majority of them wanted to improve the resources. And for our third question, we asked them how they wanted to fund their five year plan. And again, uh, a lot of it came from personal funding, which could be from revenue or income from the business. So for our uh, analysis, like I said, we found that a lot of these small business restaurants don't have a five-year plan. Um, the majority of them chose to improve the resources and hire more employees through personal funding or private loans. And like I said, uh, or I'm going to say, 
Without a five-year plan, uh, small businesses could fail in an unpredictable environment, especially with just the global recession. You never really know where it's necessarily trending towards, so they need to have a five-year plan. For the salon industry, uh, it was actually the opposite of what the restaurants found, with 67.4% uh, of the salons having a five-year plan. But similarly, similarly, with the restaurants, they mostly want to improve their resources at 39%, and their second highest is higher employees as well. For the third uh, question, we asked them how they would obtain their financing so that they could achieve these goals. And the majority at 34.9% said that they would use personal funding. So for our analysis, uh, we found out that salons, most of them had a five-year plan and that their top three things that they want to improve is their resources, hire more employees, and open more locations. Uh, and that most of them want to finance this by personal funding. But for uh, seeing this and the restaurant industry, we realize that the current trends are that they do want to hire resources and more employees, and they want to do this by using their personal funding. For, for, so our, for our first recommendation we had for the restaurant industry, we found that 50% of these restaurants don't know the basic funding. So we asked that any small business owner please go onto the Newton Waltham website and you'll be able to find you know, the funding information that you could use now. The SBA site also has a loans and grant search tool that you can use to figure out what loans and um, grants apply to you that you can apply now to your business. Uh, there's programs like the Green Low Pro Loan Program, so you, if you want to decrease your carbon footprint or just want to get a greener machinery or whatnot. It's a good pro, uh, program to go through and such as like equipment loans and whatnot. And our second recommendation is a five-year plan. Um, over, like we said, over 70% said they did not have one. So we asked that the SBI, Newton, Needham, Chamber should hold a workshop for these small businesses and create a five-year plan to flourish in a challenging, changing environment. So such things they should include are you know, go, their goals and objectives that they'd like to reach in one five-year periods, a uh, strategic plan in order to achieve these goals and objectives, and describing the products and services offered, and finally, uh, financial projections that they would want to ultimately reach. So our first recommendation for the salon would be to research the type of funding available uh, through the Newton government website, the SBA website, or the Chamber of Commerce website. Um, some of the options are the Green Loan Program, which Chris talked about, environmentally friendly, and making sure that your company can help the environment. Um, there's equipment loans, so if you need more chairs or anything, you can get loans for that. There's real estate loans, so if you want to open a new location or fix your property in any way, you would get a real estate loan. There's bond, fi bond financing which includes tax-exempt bonds, taxable bonds, infrastructure financing, capital financing, 501, pool loans, and value lease. And this shows that there's a bunch of different types of grants and loans and anything that can help you finance your business for, can be for anyone, basically. For uh, our second recommendation for salons, I think we think it's the best interest for the salons to create a five-year plan and we recommend them use personal funding or small business grants because then you won't have to pay interest and owe anyone anything and uh, to use resources like the SBI so that they can implement and create a five-year plan more effectively. Our third recommendation for the salon industry is to tell them to not decrease their marketing and advertising expenses, this way that they're still reaching their target markets to increase their sales, and also to create new marketing strategies to help in certain economical situations, especially like the recession we just had. This will help them know how to function their business during a recession and how to increase their sales and keep their customer base, and also for the Newton Chamber of Commerce to host a workshop on how to develop a strategic marketing plan to reach your target market and to also use sources like the SBI and the interns to help make new marketing strategy plans for your business. 
<coughs> so the limitations that we had uh, while conducting this research was obviously the time constraint. Uh, we had to conduct this research project just throughout the semester, so we had to make sure that our sample size was small enough so we could uh, get it finished. Also, travel was a constraint. Not all of us have a car on campus, so getting together and uh, carpooling, kind of that cut into our time, so we were constrained that way. The number of team members, we all had about six or seven members per group, so we could only uh, choose a location that we knew that we'd be able to get out to and, um, with the amount that we had. Also, we noticed that some that we went to, there were closed businesses, so that cut down on our sample size. And also, businesses refusing to complete the survey, we'd drop it off and then we wouldn't hear back from them. And then lastly, lessons learned. The process of marketing research, we didn't just uh, learn this in a classroom, we actually got to go out there and conduct the research. So it was a good first-hand experience for us. Uh, we had to learn not to be biased, because if we were biased right away, it would uh, change the way our answers would come out, and we didn't uh, want to do that. Also, the connected learning, we took everything that we learned those first few weeks in the classroom and we uh, used it out in the field. And also working with the team, it was difficult at some times, but we were able to finish it and complete it. And being professional, we knew that going into these restaurants, we didn't want them to look at us as just a student, we wanted them to take us seriously. So we had to make sure that we were professionally dressed and the way that we uh, talked to them was all in a professional manner. So before I conclude, if the rest of our team members would stand up, they were just as much a part of this as we were. All right, thank you guys very much again. Um, now quickly, I just want to invite up one more member of the LaSalle community to close this out for this evening. Um, uh, Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Jim Ostro. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. I do need to give a shout out to Hector Aweka, way back there. He's the brains behind this whole thing. Thank you, Hector. So I'd like to take a few moments to um, espouse a principle that we hold very dear at LaSalle College and I think is very important to what we've been talking about today. And the principle is the relationship between interest and effort. Uh, now, I, I agree with Daryl that if you're an entrepreneur, you're fooling yourself if you think eight hours a day you're going to be loving everything you're going to be doing eight hours a day. Of course, that's ridiculous. But at the core, it seems to me, of the success of any business, there must be an abiding and powerful personal interest. I think it's quite clear that our dream girl entrepreneurs have an interest in beer, <laughs> with all of its sweet and salty pairing possibilities. They probably developed some of that interest while they were students at LaSalle College. We, we know this. Well, then they did it before, and then they... <laughs> uh, but um, I, think, I think we would all agree that um, a passion for what you're doing as an entrepreneur is fundamentally important to the effort that you exert in delivering upon that interest, and thus it's fundamentally important to your success. It seems like a simple principle, but in our field, in our business, in education, it's remarkable how often that principle is ignored or forgotten. Here at LaSalle College, and now I'm promoting Dr. Levy, our business, uh, we don't forget that principle. We hold very fast to the idea that if students aren't, in every single thing they're doing, interested in what they're doing, intrinsically interested in what they're doing, that they won't put in the effort that's required for them to acquire depth in learning and thus to succeed. A very simple principle that I think is too often ignored today in education. I don't know if all of you are aware, but this event actually is one of many events that are part of what we call our Connected Learning Symposium. And the idea behind the Connected Learning Symposium is that because we hold to this philosophy that students should be engaged in the work of the fields they're doing as if they were actual practitioners of those fields as opposed to simply sitting passively in their seats receiving information regurgitating it that means that in any next iteration of a course students are creating and producing new things and new new kinds of understanding like our wonderful marketing research students did and so we have the symposium at the end of every semester where students are educating the LaSalle College community and also members of the surrounding community. And so this is a perfect cap 
to what was happening today and yesterday in the symposium. And it's especially valuable for us and our students when you as professionals and experts in your fields are responding to what they're doing and, and sharing in what they're doing and celebrating what they're doing. So we thank you very much for that. We believe very strongly that our educational philosophy answers one of the fundamental problems in education today, which is the problem of relevance. I'm sure all of you have heard from various quarters people questioning how is higher education relevant and relevant in a way that justifies its costs. We believe that our educational philosophy is an answer to that question. That when students are engaged in the work of their fields, when they're doing work that's relevant to them, they're also producing things that are relevant to the community, relevant to the local and global community, and so that we feel that our educational philosophy provides depth in learning and also provides value to the community. And we hope that this event is one perfect example of that, again, under the initiative of Professor Oweka. So we really thank you all for coming, and we also invite you all, all of our guests, to know that our students are ready and waiting to be entrepreneurs, to engage in projects that could serve your businesses in and through the coursework that they're doing. Our faculty are here and they're biting at the bit for those opportunities. So stay in touch and we look forward to hosting more of these events. Thank you again. All right, just quickly before we wrap up here, I want to say thank you to everybody else, everybody for coming out this evening. Um, for those of you who did take a review sheet for all of the different student presentations, on your way out, please hand those out in the Glow Lounge. Um, we're going to have food out in the Glow Lounge until about 7 o'clock, so this is a great opportunity for you guys to hang out, uh, talk with one and each, one and each other, um, network a little bit. Um, but on behalf of the entire SBI and all of the faculty, students in the program, I would like to thank you guys all for coming out and best of luck to the Newton Chamber of Commerce in kicking off the Small Business Month. Thank you. Thank you.